Hey, James, how are you this uh, Saturday evening? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. How's things going? Yeah, not too bad. I'm guessing you don't take evenings off either. <laughs> no, no downtime. Nope, nope. I remember speaking to uh, a friend who's a filmmaker as well, and I sent him a text message on Christmas Day, and he was busy editing scripts even on Christmas. So. Yeah, no, I've been there, done that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, good to finally talk to you. Anyway, we've swapped many, many messages online and tweets, etc., etc. but this is the first time we've actually spoke. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Th- I mean, thanks for, you know... Uh, hooking us all up as well and uh, yeah you know um, big fan of the site and everything so uh, yeah no no glad to glad to kind of you know do this podcast too no it's an absolute pleasure so I was looking on your IMDB page and whatnot and then reminiscing about uh, the movies and stuff it's a very small world because I have about three of your films on my shelf oh wow Um, a couple of them I've not watched yet I will confess but I do actually have them Uh, sure (laughs) and I picked up Silent Night, Bloody Night. I think I mentioned that I picked that up a few weeks back. Yeah. I sent a nice little Instagram picture out. Yeah, no, thanks um, for that. And I only just discovered you were uh, you're the producer on Amityville Asylum as well. Uh, I think I'm down as associate producer. Um, obviously, yes. that was uh, and Andrew Jones, uh, who was the producer on Night, Living Dead, Resurrection and Silent Night, Bloody Night. Uh, he he uh, wrote and directed it or whatever. Um, it's really, to be honest, like a uh, courtesy credit uh, on that film because uh, originally he offered it uh, for me to direct um, and we had a discussion about the project over like a couple of weeks or whatever. Um, but I was much more interested in doing Curb Crawlers. So it was it was one of the ones where I think just out, out of courtesy because he offered it to me first, um, I ended up with a... I kind of credit on that film, but uh, beyond some early script notes, really didn't have uh, much to do with the uh, the Amphil Asylum film. I've seen it. There. I've, se- I've seen it there and uh, enjoyed it, but uh, yeah, beyond beyond kind of script notes, not not much involvement to be honest. Because Amityville Asylum is another one, another film that's got one of my friends in it, uh, Sarah Louise Madison. Yep, Sarah Louise. Yeah, yeah. No, she's uh, yeah, she keeps on cropping up quite a bit. Um, interestingly, we kind of offered her a role in Silent Night, Bloody Night, but um, she was busy doing Doctor Who's, so obviously, you know, uh, that kind of took precedence or whatever. So, uh, yeah, she was, uh, you know, working again then up on uh, Amityville after that. But uh, yeah, no, Sarah's absolutely great. We um, got to uh, kind of use her twice on night living dead resurrection she pops up as uh, two different zombies so uh, yeah it was a lot of fun because she's eve isn't she? she's credited as eve she's down as eve which is uh, the the first uh, zombie that we actually kind of see in action if you like uh, with yeah. half of her face torn away at the bottom which was uh, yeah a great uh, makeup job by rachel southcott um, and then later on towards the towards the end of the film she actually kind of appears slightly more recognizable uh, with most of her features intact, um, wearing bizarrely kind of like this weird old, I think Victorian or Edwardian army coat. Um, again, you know, it's just kind of like one of those middle of the night kind of rush jobs where we, you know, kind of had whoever was available on set, slapped some makeup on them, and you know, got them to roam around as zombies. But uh, that's you know just low budget filmmaking, to be honest. Because it was through you that I first discovered Sarah Louise Madison, oh, who's right. now, yeah, who's now. Uh, working with the Cops and Monsters people, and I'm doing the publicity for Cops and Monsters. That purely comes from Night of the Living Dead Resurrection. Wow. Uh, then I realised, oh, she was in your film. Yeah. And then, then when she hooked up with Cops and Monsters, so did I, and so on. So, you know. Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, I've thank seen you for the, that, James. Yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. I, I assumed it was more of a Doctor Who kind of connection, but uh, I know I've seen the, um, like the, the teasers and stuff for Cops and Monsters, and it looks really good. I mean, you know, it's, it's good to kind of see more kind of genre stuff, you know, being out there on, on kind of web series and stuff like that as well. So, uh, yeah, no, great, good stuff. Was there, I mean, I was looking on various old interviews and stuff done with yourself because Night of the Living Dead Resurrection came out and I'm a massive fan of the George Romero one. Yeah. So whenever I hear that anybody's doing, be it a remake, be it an offshoot, be it something in the same universe, I'm always a little bit nervous yeah, because there are some dodgy zombie movies out there. Oh, there is probably more um, dodgy than uh, than good zombie films, yeah. <laughs> Was there any sort of... Antici- or not anticipation, but any do I really want to touch a film that's got Night of the Living Dead in the title, or were you like, yeah, let me let me have it, I'm rearing to go? Yeah, I would, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, what happened originally was uh, Andrew kind of got in contact, and he uh, he knew me kind of generally because um, we're both in the South Wales area. Um, 
and I was doing a, a short film called Final Girl, which was kind of like this love letter to slasher films. Uh, and he he dropped me a message while I was kind of I'd released the trailer and he said you know very nice things about it and he kind of said oh are you interested in doing a zombie film and you know just called it a zombie film and I was nervous for the exact same reasons you know there are so many bad zombie films that I didn't want to kind of add to the pile of them if you like um, and uh, I you know didn't say no because you know it was a feature film and you, you you don't say no when you know a guy comes to you and is is you know kind enough to kind of talk about uh, producing your first feature film. Uh, so I said, you know, yes, of course I'm interested. Uh, and then like the second message I got from him was, oh, by the way, it's a, it's a remake of Night of the Living Dead. Um, and that made me very nervous indeed. Cause I mean, the, probably like a, a great majority of horror fans, I'm you know a huge fan of the original. Um, and it's like a stripped down classic, you know, modern classic, uh, horror film. And it's completely, you know, stripped to the bone, you know, that there, there, there doesn't feel like there's any, any kind of fat on that film that, you know, there's no bits where it kind of sags in the middle or anything like that. It, you know, it gets in, it does the job and it leaves. Um, and you know, it's one of those films, which I was like, you know, very formative on me when I was, when I was a kid and I saw it when I was far, far too young. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely kind of started to, you know, worry about the idea of doing it, um, and drew up kind of like a, a very polite, uh, no thank you email to, to Andrew on it. Uh, and I, 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 I you know, drafted it and I, I left it in my draft folder before hitting send. And then I kind of slept on it. I kind of went, Whoa, hang on. Um, you know, a guy's offering, you know, to produce your first feature film. So why don't you turn this, you know, very negative email into kind of like a list of things, you know, like a statement of intent, if you like. Um, so, you know, changed it, changed it around slightly and said, you know, I will do this film if we do this, 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 and this and met up with Andrew and he was incredibly patient and he kind of, you know, we went through each of the points, you know, bit by bit, a about zombie films in general, B about remakes, uh, and then see very much specifically about this project. Um, and he was very patient and he was totally on board. I mean, I think what Andrew said was that, um, as long as it involved zombies and, and a farmhouse that we can make it our own film, which was, you know, pretty much point one of, of my email, which is if we're going to do a remake, let's do something that's respectful to the original carries the themes of the original, but pretty much otherwise we go our own way with it. Um, so that, you know, we accept full blame, uh, if people don't like it rather than doing a shot for shot remake, a la, you know, Gus Van Sant's Psycho, in which case, you know, it's slightly redundant and, you know, what's the point of doing that, which is, you know, pretty much, you know, Andrew and I saw eye to eye on night living dead resurrection on that. And that's why we've got the film we've got today. I mean, night of the living dead, the Romero one is as a whole was has been since I've seen it anyway, in my top five. Yeah horror films oh, yeah. of all time up there with the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's yeah. one of the other ones. Lovely. Um, and I really do enjoy Night of the Living Dead Resurrection. So, yeah, I, well, I'm one of those people that would have been hard to please. It worked. Yeah. So any possibility in the future of a follow on from Night of the Living Dead Resurrection with it without going into spoiler territory? But it does have scope for more if there was uh, if somebody chose to. I think I think Andrew and I like originally had an idea of uh, a, a plot which would pick up the, uh, the the character that was played by Mel Stevens. Uh, and there was a definite idea of where, where she would go. I mean, you know, obviously spoilers for anybody who, who hasn't seen it, but yeah, she's pretty much the, the only one of the, the characters that we follow who survives, but probably has a fate worse than death. And we'd kind of pick her up with the, the militia that, um, kind of grabs her at the end of the film and, and, and kind of follow where she is there was the original idea. But I know very much, I think, you know, the uh, the success of the first film and the second film has meant that, you know, Andrew or I have kind of proceeded, you know, on, on separate tangents. But, you know, I'm much more interested in kind of doing original projects. Um, I mean, the idea with the original one, obviously, was, you know, there was going to be certain brand recognition from the producer, Andrew's point of view, so that, you know, it was a good chance that, you know, we'd get funding and we would, you know, uh, get the film sold and out onto DVD, which, which it has around the world, which is great. Um, so in terms of ever coming back to revisiting night of the living dead, I mean, never say never, but, um, I think Andrew's doing very well doing what he's doing. And, you know, we, you know, the mad science crew here, we're kind of like, you know, following different paths at the moment, but it, 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 there are some good stories there. Um, whether whether we ever you know slap anything with Night of the Living Dead at the front of it again or not, it, I, I suppose it depends if we we fall on hard times again. I guess. 
Yeah, exactly. Night of the Living Curb Crawl. Well, yeah, possible. could be, could be. Yeah. I don't, there's um, some guys in uh, South Wales who have done a uh, like a, a zombie film, uh, which I think at the moment is called Granny of the Dead, and I keep on trying to conv- <laughs> yeah. co- tr- keep on trying to convince them um, they they should uh, just call it like Bingo Night of the Living Dead, and you know, absolutely, sure. you know, they, it, it would sell no problem at all. None of the dead, yeah, yeah, that type yeah. Of stuff. There was a lot of scope for that. Yeah. Um, you then went on to, and like I said, this isn't a film that I have seen, but I do actually have on my deep. I've the stockpile of films I've yet to watch is just yeah. it's, it's <laughs> insane. For every film I watch, I end up getting two in, so it, yeah. it does there. Silent Night, Bloody Night, that's right. The Homecoming, yep. Uh, remake, or I'm mean, an older film from the 70s that yeah. has a similar name. Mm-hmm. Is is yours a remake or is it a sequel to it? Or I think this one, I've... this one probably is much more of like a, a strict remake. Um, it was again, you know, kind of Andrew came to me when we were wrapping up Night of the Living Dead and said, you know, I want to, I want to do a, a, a slasher film, and and do you know this film, the original? Um, and I, I actually, again, similar to what you were saying, I, you know, I had it on DVD, but I hadn't actually ever got around to watching it. Um, it was one of the, you know, the originals, like a seventies classic, but which is you know, in every, you know, four films on one DVD kind of box set thing. So I, I, I finally took it out of this wrap and I put it on and watching it. I kind of, I, I, I saw that obviously it was kind of like a, a proto slasher, a very early slasher. It was like pre Halloween, um, shot round about the same time as black Christmas as well. Um, but while watching it, I was kind of like more struck by the fact it was almost like an American version of the Giallo film, you know, the Italian crime films that were influenced by Hitchcock and the like. Um, and to be honest, that's when I got very excited about doing the film was the idea of kind of picking up and making almost like a Welsh Giallo film. Um, and you know, pretty much then I was kind of more led on, on the visual side of things rather than from a story point of view. Um, when we kind of started rewriting the script and trying to deconstruct it, if you like, and, and, and do something with it, it's because of like the structure of the original film. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And if you take out one, one piece of the puzzle, the film falls apart. So like in terms of actually going off and doing our own thing with, with the film, you we were much more kind of restricted on, on what we wanted to do. So it was, again, a good lesson for, you know, what kind of films you can, you know, remake and, and go off and do your own thing and what kind of films actually you do need to kind of stick much more closer to the original story. Um, we do, obviously, you know, we, we, we don't try to convince anybody where it's it's set in America in the 70s, like the original one. It's, it's very, you know, modern day set in South Wales again. Um, we've got additional characters. We've also kind of streamlined certain parts of the, the plot of the original film, which to, to me anyway seemed kind of like, unnecessarily complicated um but otherwise yeah it's much more of a kind of a, a straightforward remake this time around fantastic i think there will have to be a, a james plum triple bill at some point with, uh, <laughs> yeah that way I, I can catch up i mean i've seen night of the living dead but i would happily watch that one again yeah uh, watch silent night think, and then obviously uh, yeah what we're talking about doing actually this end is because obviously we a lot of the same crew on on all three films with cope callers as well as I think one night, probably around Christmas time, we might just put all three of all the three three films on, do a triple bill ourselves, and just do kind of like a tweet along with any poor bastards that actually want to join us. Because um, I mean, I, I'm sure you can appreciate this, Stuart, having been on, on on some sets in your own time as well. It's just great fun making it, and so you know when we rewatch this stuff, it's you know just kind of like a trip down memory lane at the same time. I would turn the volume on the film down a little bit, and I would have an audio recorder there and just have the longest dvd commentary ever and whack that on the internet yeah. so everybody can can listen to it at home and it's like they're there in the living room with you because yeah. uh, you've done a commentary for silent night haven't you? we have but apparently i mean um we, we've i i we've I obviously got a copy of the dvd myself um but for some reason although it's advertised on the box i, I can't seem to actually find it on the dvd itself but we definitely recorded one uh oh damn yes it's definitely mentioned it's, on the box. it's mentioned on the box. Have, for that. have, have be... a look and, and see if you can find it on your copy i mean whether it's just eluded me but i definitely remember sitting in a room with andrew and, and recording one so um yeah you'll have to let me know if uh, if that's unsuccessful i'm sure or we've still got the recording somewhere and we probably try to load that up online somewhere because again yeah it was just you know lots of fun uh, kind of revealing all the, all the behind the scenes secrets to be honest yeah are you a fan of audio commentaries and stuff yourself i mean listening to them rather than i was i mean when you know when dvd 
first came out and everything um yeah i mean you know I'd, I'd, every dvd i'd watch i'd watch all the extras and listen to the multiple commentaries and stuff like that um you know it's, it's a great form of like film school uh, i remember i had seven on dvd and i think there was like three separate commentaries on there and i you know i watched the film and then i watched the, the film another three times with each of the commentaries um and especially david finch's stuff his commentaries are like you know just an advanced form of film school um to be honest now i mean you know i'm I'm making stuff uh, you know i get to watch a film once um and i rarely get a chance to actually kind of look on the 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 dvds i mean i i I also kind of uh do a day job and i've I've got uh, two young girls to look after as well so uh any sort of free time i try to put towards actually making films rather than uh you know kind of checking out all the supplementary material doesn't stop me from buying the dvds but you know quite like you i it's, it's getting around to actually watching them it is because I mean I noticed on one of the interviews you described yourself as a kid from the video stores, which is very similar to me. I grew up in video stores, yeah. and, um, early eighties, late late seventies, early eighties, mid eighties, etc. What are some of your memories from wandering around the video stores? I mean, how old were you when was, you wandered? Yeah, around? I was probably about ten. I was I was born in nineteen eighty, um, and like my earliest memories was Region Video, which. <laughs> uh from about must have been mid 80s just yeah being you know these it was it was you know just this it wasn't even cavernous but as, as a small child just you know kind of walking around and everything was in sections so there was a you know a horror wall and just looking at the covers for the horror films even though you know i was far too young to actually ever rent them um to the action stuff to the the, the little kids section as well uh, massive influence and you know again you know just just the the 80s in terms of like uh poster artwork was was so impressionable especially on the video you know the vhs boxes um you know it was really kind of stuff that had to stand out on the shelves um and i used to just be remember being entranced by all the friday the 13th and their sequels and the, you know the boxes and how they were all kind of like you know variations on you know uh, jason's mask and all, and all of that um, I mean, I ended up my, my first ever job when I was about 14 was, uh, you know, having been in region video as, as a kid on, you know, every weekend, my first job was working there, um, and a great job as well. You know, I, I got paid you know, two pound an hour, which I think was well below any sort of minimum wage, but, uh, you know, uh, was allowed to take home like five videos <laughs> a night or whatever. <laughs> uh and as long as it wasn't an 18 could put on a video in the shop and watch it happily so uh i sometimes kind of bent that rule slightly but made sure i pause at any time you know uh anybody who's likely to be offended by say desperado or from dust or dawn walked in uh yeah i you know video shops was a massive part of my life um yeah as a kid on the 80s i mean i remember my my parents were one of the you know the first parents on the block to actually get the vhs recorder in the house and you know just taping everything religiously as well you know, top loaders yeah yep. yeah yeah it's brilliant and you know and again you know just just taping random stuff that you know getting the tv times and looking at what was on channel four late at night and uh, you know uh, i just remember seeing stuff like uh, the chinese ghost story mr vampire 2 all the stuff from hong kong you know uh, channel bbc2 and, and channel four you just put all this stuff late night and it just sounded absolutely mad and from like a different world so you know i'd go to bed put it on to record wake up the next morning you know be gutted that i'd have to go to school and come home from school and then put on something like mr vampire 2 and be absolutely blown away that you know there were vampire films being made on the other side of the world which were completely unrecognizable from what was being made here so was horror always your genre of choice even growing up yeah you just sort of feel drawn to that I'd, I'd definitely say it was it was like i think much earlier on i think it was horror uh, and that probably comes from being a kid in the 80s you know i mean freddie and jason and, and michael myers were so dominant I mean, you know, I, I remember, you know, as a kid having like a, a Freddy glove, which you, if you think about it, you know, Freddy Krueger, this child molester, child killer has child toys that, you know, parents were buying for their kids. It just seems absolutely mad now as a parent myself. But I think between that and, and sci-fi, I mean, you know, uh, it was a great time to, to, to be a kid because, you know, again, I think a lot of it's to do with VHS. You'd, you, you know, you'd buy either copies of stuff like Red Dwarf as a kid or, you know, you'd buy uh you know sci-fi and fantasy stuff and you just watch that tape until you know it was pretty much worn you know absolute bald um and you know it becomes ingrained in your system uh and i think just the 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 80s was a good time to be a kid in terms of the actual output of films i mean although it wasn't particularly mentally challenging stuff stuff like the spielberg films the zemeckis stuff you know the back to the futures the ivan reitman with the ghostbusters 
eighties was a great time to be a kid because you were just being bombarded with all this, you know, big budget sci-fi horror tinge stuff. Um, which would just mean that, you know, of course it was you know, almost the gateway drug onto, you know, harder sci-fi or harder horror. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was hooked at a very early age. Uh, I mean, I was very lucky that my mum, you know, was, I think like, like a lot of people, you know, very, you know, who kind of end up either making horror films or, you know, kind of uh, get into horror films, their, their mums probably have a lot to do with it. Uh, and I remember my mum letting me watch Robocop. Um, uh, and pretty much when it came out on VHS, which I'm guessing was probably, I must have been about eight, eight, nine, yeah, maybe. maybe? About, about 88. Well, 88, 88 and, yeah, when it came out on video, yeah. And I, it came out on video, and, um, you know, obviously there were, there's some certain violent bits in that, but I remember, you know, she kind of sat down to me afterwards and said, you know, did you like that? And I went, yeah. And she's like, well, here's Terminator, and boom. Suddenly, you know, in, entering into this this whole world of, uh, of great stuff. Um so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it, it was a, a perfect time. Um, and I imagine, you know, if anything, nowadays kids are, you know, exposed to so much choice, but it's almost a bit like, you know, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. There's too much to choose from. Um, and you see stuff like Netflix. I mean, I've, you know, hooked up to Netflix myself. But the the algorithms that use for recommendations can be an absolute nightmare because there's just too much choice. Um, and you know, I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, are, are, are kids having the, the same kind of experience? Are they given, being given kind of like the same high quality output? I mean, saying that, you know, I still remember watching absolute drag, sci-fi drag and stuff like that, but still, you know, I mean, I always have this conversation, well, I don't always have the same conversation with my co-hosts on the horror show that I do, but it's, are there too many films? Is there too much choice? I say yes, in some ways, mm. I think in one way is it, it's really good because, more films are out there, more filmmakers can be noticed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But for a viewer, it can be a nightmare, especially it's Netflix. Mm. You scroll through Netflix. I can spend 90 minutes scrolling through Netflix yeah. trying to find something to watch, and then you know I could have watched the film by then. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think I think I think that's the thing that we've got now, and um, you know, we, we, in a way, as you say, we're we're in this world now where you know you can act, you know, you think of a film and there's a good chance that within 20 minutes, if you think of a film, you'll be able to find it online somewhere. Um, so I think it's much more, it's, it's much difficult to browse, but it's much more, it's much easier to, if you've got a certain film that you want to watch, it's much easier to kind of almost get that instant gratification, if you like, rather than having to go down to the video store and hope it's in. Uh, cause I still remember, you know, the days you, you go to the video store, there'd be one copy and of course it was out and it would be out for weeks so, yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of one of those uh, kind of catch 22s, really. Well, I got my job in the video store because I wanted to rent a copy of Highlander 2. <laughs> and they had one copy, and it was just, it was, you know, can I order it? Yes, it'll be in at seven o'clock. And I went in, and it didn't show up. So I ordered it for the next night, went back in at seven o'clock, still wasn't in. Went back in on a Wednesday. Oh, it's still not back in. I thought, I'm not going on with that. So I'm going to wait. So I was there for hours. And then I overheard one of the staff saying, oh, I can't wait to finish here next week. So I'm like, oh, job going. So I applied for it and got it. So, yeah. There you go. Bittersweet. So there, there was a good there was a good ending to Highlander 2 in the end. Then. Yes. I'm not, <laughs> I, I do like Highlander 2. I think it's it's got its issues. But, uh, you know, it's got Michael Ironside in it. So. Yeah. I, visually, visually, I'll agree with you. I mean, um, what's the guy called? Russell, whatever. The, Russell Mulcahy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, visually, obviously, he was up to, he was able to kind of just up the ante on that. Amazing. There's some amazing shots, but uh, I don't know. I'm too much of a fan of the original to even kind of comprehend what they, what they do with the story in the second one, to be honest. It, but there is another version of it out there. I don't know whether you've seen what they call the renegade version, but they do alter it to make sense. Uh, so they, they get rid of all the alien references and the planet Zeist, and they do yeah. tie it into the immortals, and it, it is a better version, and it's also longer, which is quite good. So they've kind of retconned out all of the uh, yeah the, the alien stuff. Okay, okay, I might have to track that one down then. Because apparently the story with that, they'd already spent all, because they shot it in Argentina, I believe, right. and they'd, they'd spent all the money for the film before they'd even shot a frame. <laughs> so they were in, you know, that's that's not a good state to be in. I mean, you're a filmmaker. Like, if you spent your budget before you've shot anything, you've kind of, you know, that's an issue. That is impressive. And it, the insurance company took over wow. and did what they did just to spit the film out there. So, you know, I'm sure they can uh, take some of the blame. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you miss the days of video stores? 
I do. Um, I, I guess especially as a filmmaker as well. Um, you know, it's one of those things where primarily, you know, in order to actually get my film seen, um, you know, it's 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 supermarket shelves now. There, there aren't there aren't independent video shops, you know, rental shops. We haven't got blockbusters. HMV just about hung on. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much now, you know, for for any sort of filmmaker, you, you're looking at, you know, your Tesco's, your Asda's, and your Sainsbury's. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I spent a huge amount of time not only at the Regent Video I worked at, but we also had a, like a blockbuster just down the road and you know as, as much as people kind of you know said that blockbuster was the the beginning of the end of the video stores that's where i saw all of you know my early john woo films was through blockbusters you know they had copies of the killer and hard-boiled before anybody else did as well so yeah but you know if, if people aren't going to video shops people aren't going so it's it's, it's an awkward thing um i suppose we're more reliant on things you know uh, video on demand and streaming now exactly I mean, I think uh, DVD and obviously the internet were at the end of video stores. Mm. I closed mine down in 2003 right, yeah. because DVD came out. People were able to rip them to a PC. Yeah. They were able to download them. Obviously, they weren't able to download them as quick as they can nowadays, yeah. but the piracy was so much easier. And also, uh, DVD was far more appealing to the customer to go out and buy in a, in a store for 13 quid or whatever it was. Mm. Mm. With all the special features and the yeah. making of, yeah. and who who would go into a video store and pay two fifty or three pounds just to rent a bare bones rental version of the same film? Yeah, so that's course, pretty yeah. much that's when I saw the beginning and the end, and I thought, well, I can either get out with a little bit of money, or I can run this store for another three four years, and then it'll just die miserably. So I thought, I don't want to kill it, so I'll just I choose to close it down. So yeah, I, it, I it's, it's a sad thing because I mean, at, at the same time, you kind of almost lost. The, the kind of the physical community as well that was based around video shops i mean you know we had regulars at the shop i used to work in and you know again it used to be recommendations on a friday night nowadays you know you, you i suppose the, the closest is is uh you know replicated in terms of online forums but still it's 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 never quite the same thing and um yeah you're never quite sure you know who actually is recommending what to you Exactly. I don't never go off online forums. <laughs> film reviewers are vicious. They yeah. really, really are vicious. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, even when I'm writing reviews, I, I, never, I never class them as reviews. I don't know what they are. It's just me typing my thoughts or whatever. And I have this, um, I have a co-host on the horror show, Stu Miller, who is, he's very, very vicious when it comes to films. Yeah. He yeah. will watch a film and go, that's terrible. That's the worst film ever made. The filmmaker <laughs> didn't know what they were doing. And it really annoys me. I've had many arguments with him going, seriously, you need to just chill out. <laughs> you need to just, you need to appreciate the fact that people have put a lot of work into this film. And it does annoy me when people just flippantly, you know. Well, I mean, as long as it, there's a good cop, bad cop, though, if you're the good cop in that scenario, then, you know, it all works out okay. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I remember having an argument with somebody on Facebook who was ripping a, a film to pieces and said, well, tell you what. And he had a go at me for apparently liking every film that I saw. Um <laughs> I said I didn't like every film, so I just if I don't like it, I generally don't talk about it. That's the way I yeah. I sort of work. Uh, and I said to him, I said, tell you what, when you've made your film, <laughs> you let me know and I'll watch it and I'll review that for you. Because half the time they've never even they've never even made one. No, it is it is a tricky thing, and I think <laughs> it, it extends out like the difference between making short films and making features. Because I mean, for you know, like the first few years of you know, kind of me coming out of university, I was I was making shorts and not doing anything with it, and. Um, it's an eye-opening experience. I mean, the, the obviously you know you're using the same kind of kit and everything, but the the, the challenges of, of making a feature and making a feature that you know is entertaining for its hour and a half you know kind of uh, runtime is, is an interesting one. And uh, yeah, it's 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 always an awkward thing with reviewers. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing that obviously a lot of reviewers become filmmakers as well further on down the line, and uh, you know seeing some some succeed and some not so much. So. Uh, yeah, it's always an interesting one to keep an eye out for. It is definitely a bit of a minefield out there, <laughs> the old internet, isn't it? <laughs> so, talking a lot about remakes, obviously Silent Night, Bloody Night, mm-hmm. Night of the Living Dead. Uh, you, you were very nearly involved in the Amityville yeah. Asylum. Yeah. But you said you wanted to do more original films. Yeah. Which brings I mean, there, there was nothing against the, the, the project itself. I mean, Curb Crawlers actually. Um, 
was pitched to me by a really good friend of mine, David Malkovic, um, who's an incredibly talented uh, script writer. Uh, and one of the first guys when I moved down to South Wales that I just kind of, you know, kind of bonded with in terms of we've got incredibly similar tastes in, in both good and bad films. Um, and he sent me an amazing kind of two text message pitch. Um, and I'll, I'll say the first uh, text message because that's not a spoiler, but I, I always kind of <laughs> keep keep the second one back. Uh, and the first text was just, you know, uh, a group of guys um, pick up a, a girl to to make a found footage snuff film. And that, that was the first one. And I, in between him sending the first uh, text and the second text, I, I sent the text just going, I'm in. Then he sent through the second text, which was kind of like, you know, a slight twist of the film. And it absolutely blew my mind. So I was like, I've absolutely, absolutely got to do this. And it was one of those things where, you know, I'm working on on Silent Night, Bloody Night, the slasher film, but still having meetings and having a chat with all the crew on there about this this next film. Uh, so I'm chatting with the makeup guy who, unfortunately, we, we didn't end up using on Curb Callers, but, you know, still we were talking to him about doing some of the practical effects. Talking to the to the sound guy, Paul Brooks, who's who we've kind of worked with every time, about, you know, the challenges of doing audio on a found footage film. Because obviously with found footage, you're not supposed to be, you know, dropping in incidental music or atmospheric music. So there's there's other tricks you've got to use. So all while doing this, we, we were kind of getting more and more excited about doing, you know, curb crawlers. So, you know, Andrew kind of comes to me and says, look, I managed to get the funding for Amateurville. I think we can do curb crawlers after it. So I was just in this position where I was like, you know, do I commit myself to a film I'm not passionate about? In which case, you know, the film itself probably suffers. Or, you know, do I kind of, you know, go in alone and, and, and do curb crawlers? Um, and so I, I, I made quite a, you know, difficult decision of, of going off and, and doing curb crawlers. I, you know, the fact it was an original project was was a, was a bonus. But, I you know, even if it, say, it was a, a, a remake or, or, or something else, I think just because of the, 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 the strength of the concept itself, was you know kind of what hooked me and obsessed me for about a year before we even got around to actually shooting anything at all. Yeah. I mean, I was reading the IMDb page, etc. You know, on, on details on that and trying to work out a plot summary to, <laughs> to use as a pitch. And the first line of it mentions the five guys doing a snuff movie, and that's when I thought, right, I'm in <laughs> because I, I can't think not because of like oh I really want to watch a snuff movie, no, but just no, no, no. because it's a description where you you don't sort of think oh another another thing about people doing a stuff movie mm. another one mm. can't think of another film mm. there may be one out there but i can't think of one there the are of there are a few i mean for me the idea was and you know obviously uh when when dave malkovic pitched this to me it was back in 2012 um for me it was the idea of a group of guys doing a snuff film the idea was it just harking back to the, more of that revenge exploitation era 70s stuff you know much more of the grindhouse stuff and you know when i when i described the film you know i alternate between found footage or calling it just a 21st century exploitation film and very much the way we kind of build up the characters i, I remember one of the first um treatments dave melkovic gave me uh, my co-writer on curb crawlers he, he he kind of said um originally it was much more of a attack set up in that you know this group the the this this the, they they just kind of buy this girl off another group of hoodlums i'm like no 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 that, that's dull why don't we start before that why don't we you know see the guys get the girl you know so you have this the first act build up is you meet the group of guys and you meet them one by one um and the trick that we're trying to pull on it and it's an interesting one and the feedback that we've had the early feedback that we've had from people is that it seems to be working but the trick we're trying to pull is in, in the first act where you don't know that they're making a snuff film it's it's hinted at but you don't know exactly what the plan is it's hinting at um the the idea is that you actually start to like hanging out with these guys they're not unpleasant guys um and again it's it's just the idea of you know playing with the audience's expectations so you think it's like a boys night out and it just happens to be a video camera and they kind of make references to a plan then when we get into the second act and we get very much into the the snuff film territory um you know the audience is suddenly flipped and they're kind of like well wait a second for the first 20 minutes of this film i've been you know following these guys and they seem like nice guys but now you're telling me it's something else so then you know we've got this uncomfortable second act where the audience completely doesn't know where they are uh and then without giving away the third act we then flip it again um 
And the interesting thing is whether in that third act people start to sympathize for the guys again or if they don't. Um, and we tried to do something similar with Night of the Living Dead Resurrection with the, you know, the family in the, in the, the farmhouse. Obviously, we follow Ben. Um, and again, sorry for spoilers for people who haven't seen it yet, but it, it was, it's been out on DVD for a while now, guys. Um, you know, it, we follow Ben and everything. And of course, Ben is a character who's named in the original film. So you think this is going to be, you know, a different telling of the same story. And, you know, Ben turns up at this farmhouse and he tries to get in and boom, he gets shot in the face by what turns out to be the heroes of the film. Uh, and again, it's just playing with audiences' expectations, and you know, hopefully, what we were trying to go for, at least, and I don't know whether we were successful. Some people seem to get it. Some people just pissed off by the fact we killed Ben in the first twenty minutes. Um, was that you know we wanted within the first twenty minutes for the audience to go, oh, this wasn't the Night of the Living Dead that we expected. Um, yeah. And you know, I, th- I think we got that. It's just some people liked it, and some people didn't. Uh, and I, I, I think I think it worked because it certainly with horror, mm. there's I mean the horror fans they're probably the most diehard, obsessive of, about their genre. They're very protective of it, and you know, the, the, possibly the most critical. Yeah. I think when it comes to reviews, yeah. is with horror films, you generally watch... I mean, I was watching a film the other day called See No Evil 2 by Jen and Sylvia Sosa. Oh, wow. You've seen a copy of it. I have. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get a screener sent to me oh, from, uh, from Lights. I'm very So jealous. I watched that one. <laughs> and um, I was watching that thinking, oh, yeah, I know where this is headed. Uh, and it wasn't because the, Sos- the Soskos know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. But there were several moments in the film where I think, oh, yeah, I can see what's going to happen now. Mm. But it didn't. Mm. And, it, and it, it messes with your head. Because you try to outsmart the filmmaker. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I see where he's going with mm. this one. And it's really, really nice to sort of be fooled. It's so. great. I mean, I think, you know, again, uh, one of, one of you know, kind of my favorite cinema experiences as a kid was, uh, again, being slightly too young to see it in the cinema, but still uh, seeing from Dust Till Dawn. And, you know, going in expecting to just see another Tarantino film. And, you know, again, in, in the UK, it was very much just advertised as a, you know, as a, a gangster film. You know, you just saw a bunch of people with guns on the on the cover of the poster. Uh, and then, what was it, about 45 minutes in, of course, you know, um, Danny Trejo pops up again as a vampire. And then, boom, suddenly we're into brilliant KMB vampire effects all over the place. And uh, it's that. I think, for, for me, that is probably where the future of horror, you know, can lie in, in terms of kind of just subverting audience expectations and, and playing with those expectations. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Soskers did it brilliantly with their first feature, Dead Pooker in the Trunk, um, which, I, have you seen that, Stuart? I haven't seen it, but I do mention that film title pretty much every <laughs> horror show I do because I can't find a film that's got a cooler title than that one. I, that's pretty much, that's yeah, my benchmark. I was, I was lucky enough to see it uh, at a horror festival in Wales called Abattoir, um, which is an amazing festival. But um, yeah, it was, you know, they kind of played it. Uh, I think it was the, not the, the, the first UK screening, but the second UK screening. Um, I think the first UK screening was somewhere even more obscure. Uh, and I just remember it was on at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. So most people were hung over from the night before, but I was determined not to miss a film called dead hooker in the truck. And I, I was not disappointed. It's like snakes on a plane, dead hooker in a trunk. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I did see American Mary. I think that was the first Soska sisters project. That so Yeah. Seen. Yeah. Again, I, I, I managed to see that a, a couple of years later at Abattoir as well. I think, uh, the organizers of Abattoir are like a massive, massive, uh, yeah. Uh, fan of the Soskas and, uh, yeah, fair play. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're churning out some good stuff at the moment. I, I, Am I right in thinking they also have a segment in the new ABCs of Death as well? I think I think they do indeed. Stu Miller did tell me which letter they did, but I've forgotten it. But oh, no, okay. and apparently it's the best segment in the ABCs of Death too. Wow, he's seen that one. But I would not know, surprise. But... Yeah, yeah. No, I'm looking. For, I'm looking forward to seeing their latest stuff as well. So, although yeah, they seem to be kind of churning out at the moment. I, I already, I think I followed them on Instagram or Twitter or something. They're already kind of in production or in post production of their one after that, which I think is an action film as well. So. Good on them. I mean, it's, it's it's brilliant to kind of just see, you know, directors or whatever just producing this massive body of work. You know, I mean, as a, as a kid, I was and still am a huge fan of Carpenter, and it was always exciting to hear when John Carpenter was you know coming out with a new film. Um, the excitement grows less and less with his later stuff, but still, you know, it, it's great to see just uh, you know people you know keep on making films and to kind of appreciate 
even if they're exploring different genres, just all of the, the different output that they're doing. I mean, I always wonder why Carpenter's not still making films. He did The Ward a few years ago. Yeah. And he passed as a horror episode. But it's like, come on, John. What, what is he doing? I, th- I don't know what he's I doing. Think, I think I, re- I read an interview from him just saying, you know, he's, he's just getting on and he's tired. And, you know, he apparently he's, he's a big gamer. Uh, is what I read. I think he's, I, I don't know if it's Xbox or whatever, but I think he just likes, you know, sitting back and playing Xbox. So, you know, if he wants to retire, he, he he's earned it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'll miss, I'll miss the output, and, but you know, I've still got <laughs> pretty much his entire run on DVD and Blu-ray, but uh, yeah, it'd be nice to see some more stuff from him, but uh, Hey, you know, we'll give him a break. Uh, who else, who else is your, uh, your favorite horror directors wow producers, okay um yeah i mean carpenter is, is the one uh to be honest um obviously romero as well a uh, big fan of romero's stuff especially martin i think that's one that doesn't really kind of get uh, enough praise his, his vampire film from the 70s um the palmer although you know he was kind of horror and into suspense and thriller uh, i really enjoyed like you know he again just kind of had like a, a key period where the stuff he was doing, you know, with dress to kill and body double and stuff, it was even if not perfect or kind of mainstream, there was definitely interesting stuff in all of those. Um, and then just kind of more oddball stuff. Uh, Alex Cox, again, not strictly a, a horror director, but you know, with repo man and, and, and some of the other stuff he did in the eighties, Sid and Nancy, it was just those, those kind of films were just, you know, very bold and, you know, just very visual. Um, and I think it's the visual directors that kind of get to me much more. Because, you know, I, I, I think a lot of the stuff that we've got now, we've got great script writers, but, you know, too often it's, it's you know, telling the audience stuff rather than trying to show the audience stuff. And, and there are exceptions, um, but it's always the those directors which are, you know, very visual and are able to communicate so much in, in, in so little dialogue. Those are the ones that always tend to get me. It's so good to hear John Carpenter mentioned on podcast. He does. He does need more mentions. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, I, I go back. You know, pretty much from. I, I go back as early as Dark Star because I, I do enjoy Dark Star. Um, but okay, we'll, we'll go one later from Assault on Precinct Thirteen straight through to and including They Live. That is a perfect run of films for me. I would probably include in the Math of Madness as well. There, I you know, I, I need to rewatch. No. I, I haven't I haven't <laughs> seen it for probably about ten years, and I remember just being slightly disappointed. But yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give it a rewatch at some time, definitely. And I think obviously after that, I mean, I quite like vampires. Anything with James Woodson is is usually. I just found good. it very odd. He, you know, it, he's the kind of guy I imagine to see in a suit, not in like a leather jacket and and denim. It was it was yep. just an odd <laughs> casting choice. I'm actually much more patient and probably more so than other people of Ghost of Mars. Just to, you know, it was Assault on Precinct 13 with Pam Grier and Ice Cube. I w- I was fine with that. <laughs> Have you watched that recently though? Uh, it's been a while. It doesn't stand no. up well. I saw Ghost of Mars at cinema. And I, I liked it. I really, really liked yeah, it because John saw, Carpenter's yeah, back. I, I, I stole the, the poster from my local cinema. Uh, yeah, good, good steal. Yeah. Uh, and then I, obviously I owned it on VHS at the time, yeah. and then bought the DVD, and we rewatched it maybe six weeks back, and it doesn't really no. uh, hold up, unfortunately, which is a shame. Yeah, but, how, how does it compare against the Ward though? Uh, the Ward I've only ever seen once, and I did quite like it. But I'm one of these. It's like I could watch a film and go, I didn't like that. And then somebody says, oh, but John Carpenter or Oliver Stone or David Cronenberg made it. And I'm like, that is one of the best films I've seen this year. <laughs> I can be very two-faced when it comes to, to filmmakers for some reason. I, I Again, I haven't seen The Wood since it came out, but I just I think probably because it didn't have that John Carpenter score, it just didn't feel like a John Carpenter film to me. That was the one thing I miss is, or, you know, even if he didn't make films, if he made scores for other people's films, I'd, I'd be in heaven. That'd be fine. You know, his, his music is again so influential and you know uh jim james morrissey the, the guy i kind of co-edit with and who's done the scores to my films most of night of the living dead i've just said to him just as much as possible without us getting sued just try kind of you know do some john carpenter stuff and my favorite bits of night of the living dead still are just certain bits where he kind of crosses over between two scenes with a very like john carpenter synthy bass line and I'm, i still get tingles <laughs> nice 
So anyway, so we're mainly here this evening, A, to have a conversation with each other, but curb crawlers, because yeah. you've got the premiere coming up at Scardiff. Yeah. Is that right? The, the Cardiff Film Festival in October. Yeah. For some weird reason, I thought that was this coming week. I'm like, oh, we've got to get this podcast sorted really quickly. I really uh, hope it I isn't, I'm still tonight. working on the sound mix. So. <laughs> well, 19th of October, I believe yes. it is, according yeah. to, the, uh, to the artwork. So well, yeah. is this yeah. the first time it's going to be seen in front of a biggish audience it's, it's the first time yeah i mean pretty much the people who've seen it before have been people i've sent it to on like private youtube links or whatever just to get feedback from so yeah this is uh world premiere this is uh first cast and crew screening apart from a few people you know who, who heads of departments who've kind of watched it to get their feedback on you know certain bits that we've changed yeah very excited um it's we it, we've been in post-production for it for a very long time especially a long time for me but um, I think one of the things we wanted to do was really kind of use the found footage genre to uh, advantage. Um, and I, I don't know about you, Stuart, and how you feel about the found footage genre, but I always feel it's one of those ones where people go into the found footage genre just thinking it's going to be cheap and easy to do. Um, it may be cheaper, but it's, having made one, it's definitely not easier than shooting a traditional film. Um, and the ideas that we kind of have with it, you know, and, and using the found footage genre to kind of like its full extent, especially in that last act, um, has kind of meant that basically a lot of the film in the, the last act, uh, for the past couple of months, we've pretty much been kind of messing around with frame by frame, but that also probably just helps that I'm a control freak and, you know, those two <laughs> things kind of go hand in hand, to be honest. On the last horror show that I did, which was about a week ago, because I do a regular movie show, I do a British movie show, and I do a horror movie show. Wow. So this one fits into all three. So this Great. will be on all three feeds. So that's good. Cool. Um, <laughs> Stu Miller had come up with a question, when is a found footage film and not a found footage film? So I'm like, well, hey, you need to explain the question to me. <laughs> and he he's under the impression, I disagreed with him, he said in order for a film to be a found footage film, mm. the footage needs to be discovered within the film itself. And I went, no. At all, because he said the Blair Witch Project, the first one, technically isn't a found footage film mm. because they don't find the footage till the second film. Mm. And I'm like, I see your point, but you're wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Blair Witch Project yeah. as well. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very clever. Mm. I love the marketing, etc. Um, for me, found footage, it's one of those genres that people nowadays get a little bit nervous at yeah. because they go, oh, yeah, it's obviously they didn't have a big budget, like you've just mentioned. Yeah. Oh, it's obviously cheap to do. Mm. And it's not, as you mentioned again, it's more tricky. Oh, yeah. There are things you've got to, there's more extra rules that you've got to follow. There, there are the rules. Um, the music one, which I mentioned earlier, um, and, you know, just talking about how much I love Carpenter stuff, a, a big thing, and, you know, kind of knowing the rules going in is like, you know, okay, what can what can you do if you don't have those music stings, you know? Uh, and Night of the Living Dead Resurrection, you know, we were a big fan of those John Carpenter, you know, just long sustained notes playing through through a scene. You can't you can't do that. Um, so this is why I met with the sound guy like a year before we shot the film and said, look, we're writing the script. I'm having a meeting with you now. What things can we write into the script, into the location that could actually serve in in lieu of doing the music? And so, you know, we were talking about, OK, well, if it's set in a warehouse and this scene is set in a warehouse, you know, it could be a metal roof and there could be rain hitting the roof and stuff like this. Or there could be a fan going. And, you know, if the wind's going, then that increases the fan. If there's a squeak on the fan, then, you know, you get that kind of aliens effect where, you know, the in, in James Cameron's aliens, the aliens are approaching quicker. And you've got that the, you know, the uh, detector kind of, you know, uh, increases in, 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 in speed when it, they're getting closer. So it's all of these extra things that you're kind of writing into the script as you go it's it again it's just much more preparation is required because you can't cheat certain things and again with special effects of course you can hide certain special effects in a cut in a found footage film of course the camera's meant to be running so if, if the camera cuts there's got to be a reason for the cameraman who is a character in the film to cut the camera um so it's all these things that you've got to you know have a good reason to be able to you know cheat or, or think it through in terms of okay where can i hide the tube so that blood spurts out of this guy's head in one long take i also think with the found footage thing one of the things that i said to, to Stu miller was as long as it's as long as there's a reason for the film to be mm. a found footage mm. then mm. i'm fine with that mm. like the blue witch project yeah. and from the sounds of it curb crawlers because you've got people who are out to make a snuff movie yeah 
and you're obviously going to need a camera to do that. Therefore, that's your found footage character. I mean, I think, right. yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the thing with found footage is it's, it's the same with, although it's not really a subgenre in itself, it's more like a format, a way of telling a story. It's, it's the same with anything. You know, there, there are bad zombie films and there, you know, there are very bad slashes out there. Uh, there are very bad found footage films. But I also think that I, there's a lot more still to be done with the, the format of the subgenre still. Um, which is, you know, part of the reason that we kind of tackled curb crawlers with as much excitement as we did. Um, it'd be it'd be interesting to see, yeah, you know, what kind of reaction we get from the audience. I think, you know, we kind of pushed it a lot further than than we were because it was an original property. Because you know, we didn't feel that you know there was any kind of fan service needed to be done to you know fans of the original property as there would be with Night of the Living Dead or or Silent Night Bloody Night with curb crawlers. We kind of you know were let off the leash if you like um we were jo- joking actually while making silent like bloody night the second film that you know things were getting quite dark and bleak and we really should make like a rom-com that certainly isn't curb crawlers <laughs> that doesn't sound like it no <laughs> no and and we kept on joking that after curb crawlers the next one we were going to do was going to be a kids film um and we've kind of written one but at the same time, there's this other project that we might do, which is incredibly bleak as well. So yep. at some point, <laughs> I, I, I am getting get around to doing this happy-go-lucky feel-good film of the summer sometime. Now, have you attended Scardiff before, or is this a new festival? Yeah, no, no. Um, Scardiff was actually kind of born out the year before last um, from a Cardiff comic book festival. Um, and I was kindly invited by the kind of co-organizers um one of which was wayne simmons uh just to do a horror talk um and it was myself andrew jones the producer of night living dead at the time alex harper who was the special effects guy on silent night bloody night and some other authors including wayne simmons who's a, who's an author himself um and basically you know we had like a it was in a hotel and there was a conference room where you know certain breakout sessions were done and we were just doing a talk um and it was at that talk basically they must have had enough seats for about 150 people that room was filled like there were people sitting in the aisles and everything like that and it was that that talk that you know that was done that kind of inspired wayne to say christ there's a real want there's a there's a real desire for some sort of horror fest or horror convention in cardiff so then the year after which was last year um was the first ever scardiff um and again wayne was very kind to kind of invite me to that and we screened the the world premiere of the curb crawlers teaser trailer uh and it went down absolutely amazing um and again, you know, I, I managed to drag along the cast and crew of that. We all kind of got into our curb crawlers, boiler suits and, uh, you know, just kind of patrolled the floor and, and met with other horror fans. Um, and it was one of those great, really good festivals. Um, and I'm really hoping that this year's one is is just even a fraction as good as last year's because it's a really nice mix. I mean, for me, I go to these things as a fan anyway. So, you know, when you get to meet other filmmakers or other authors or just other fans and just talk about what, you know, horror films you guys enjoy and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, also just meeting, yeah, other, other you know, filmmakers in terms of, you know, making contacts and stuff like that. And, of course, on top of that is, you know, promoting your own stuff as well. Um, and we just it was it was brilliant the, the kind of response that we had last year. So when Wayne invited me this year and kind of said, oh, you know, how's Curb Crawlers looking? Uh, and I was like, we're nearly done. And he was like, well, you know, how would you like it to be kind of like the main film of the festival? And I was just like, I would be incredibly honored um, and still kind of in in shock about it all, to be honest. At the same time, he kind of snuck in the, sec- the, the fact of would, would I mind running like a low budget filmmaking, uh, you know, a low budget horror filmmaking workshop? I was just agreeing to anything at that point, which uh, I still need to kind of put aside some time to actually to, <laughs> to prepare that workshop. But uh I, I, well, on, I, I'm, I'm assuming on, it's a bit like the, the commentary. I love giving away. I'd make a terrible magician. I love giving away the secret so much that I think I'm going to have a whale of a time just kind of, you know, telling people how we achieved certain stuff on, you know, absolutely no money. We can have a look on the website because it's got all the bullet points of all the things you're going to be talking about. So that's quite nice. Well, yeah, I, I, I wrote that. Um, <laughs> and uh, again, I think I was still on the high from yeah, Wayne offering me kind of like the, the, the slot at, at Cobra, uh, for the Cobra as well, Premier. So, uh, yes, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I need to work out PowerPoint. That would be good. Isn't it weird how you just say yes to things? Though? I mean, I was on a podcast interviewing the director of Cops and Monsters, yeah. and he, he mentioned that he was doing a Comic-Con in Nottingham, and he said, oh, would you like to host it? And I went, yeah, all right. 
<laughs> and then uh, I'd never done anything like that before, but I, I said yes. And then about a month after that, he said, oh, we're doing one in London. Uh, would you like to do that? I'm like, yeah, all right. And why do I keep saying yes to these things? But it was fun. But yeah, somebody catches you and you end up just going, uh, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think that's where, you know, opportunities just kind of come from. And um yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, again, you know, kind of going back to the commentaries, I, I'd never done a commentary, and Andrew kind of said, oh, you know, uh, you know, it's required for the extras and stuff. Do you, do you mind sitting down and doing one for Night of the Living Dead Resurrection? And so the only time we actually had an opportunity to do it was two in the morning after we'd shot a whole bunch of stuff for Silent Night, Bloody Night. And because we, you know, used a lot of the same cast and crew, we all kind of came back to my house two in the morning, sat down and recorded the night living dead resurrection. And we were shattered because we'd been filming for about 18 hours straight, but it was still great fun because there was me and Jim, uh, who co edits with me. We had Vicky, who was the first AD. We had Mel who was watching it for the first time. Uh, who's Mel Stevens, who's, you know, part of the cast and crew of all three of my films actually. Um, and it was, it was, it was just great fun, you know, just revealing all the, all the tricks and, you know, all the references as well. Cause you know, I, I, I am a bit of a nerd that way. I do kind of enjoy doing the the little, you know, horror or sci-fi Easter eggs in each of my films too. I mean, the Night of the Living Dead one, is that on the DVD? Because I looked at the box on that tonight and I couldn't see any reference on that. There's box. no reference. This is the bizarre thing. There's actually no reference on the box, but there is a commentary on Night of the Living Dead Resurrection, yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's my day sorted tomorrow, yeah. listening to that one and trying to find the other one. Yeah, so, I, yeah. again, I, I, I think I say this on the commentary, we are not drunk, it is just, we are very tired. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I did re-listen to it just to see whether we were going to get sued by anybody for being, you know, a bit too out there or whatever. No, I, but I'm fairly sure a couple of the cast were trying to get sponsorship deals. They mentioned stuff like Starbucks and Adobe quite a bit. <laughs> yep. Hey, you got to go with what works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So are you going to be doing a Q&A session at Scardiff after the film? or? or yeah, film? yeah. I mean, again, Wayne seems to be kind of rolling out the red carpet for for the Curb Crawlers crew, which is amazing. Um, I think from what I understand, it's going to be pretty much they're going to do the, the workshop first. So it's pretty much, you know, this is, you know, this is how we did it. And now come watch the film. Then we've got the world premiere and then somebody, possibly Wayne or somebody else is going to lead a Q&A with me and the cast and crew um yeah and and that's going to be straight after the film itself so yeah i mean i'm, I'm amazingly honored that uh, you know wayne's kind of basing this all, all, all around curb crawlers but you know I, I i made sure he'd seen the film first in case in case you know <laughs> yeah. i kind of set him up for a big failure but no he's he's very happy with the film so uh yeah i'm good to go put the film on and then wayne's like i uh, can have a word yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This is this is this is not the Living Dead or <laughs> Silent Night. What are you doing? But no, it sounds like Scardiff's going to be pretty impressive. Yeah, I've, it's it's just it's, it's, it's. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm the same with. I, I go to uh, Abattoir, which is the the horror film festival in Aberyst with uh, fairly regularly as well. And it is. I think we were talking about this slightly earlier about just the horror horror community. It, it can be very critical, but at the same time, it can be very warm um and you know it's very adventurous and you know people people will try stuff and people will try i think it's a lot more tolerant of low budget than other genres are um where you know but also you know the the gloves come off as well um and you know the the film festivals and the film cons but the genre ones are, are the best ones and it, it, it's odd, isn't it? I mean, you, there aren't that many, you know, kind of crime film festivals out there or action film festivals, at least not on the same kind of scale as you get with the horror film festivals. Uh, and I almost think that's kind of sad because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, you know, other films as well. Um, but it's because of the community, you know, around the horror stuff that, you know, I think my, my first, you know, allegiance is always to horror genre. Yeah. I mean, they are some of the best sort of fans. They're extremely loyal. Yeah. You know, if you, if you take a horror fan and then show them a hundred films and ninety nine of them aren't very good, that person will still remain a horror fan, yeah. <laughs> and they'll just keep watching the next hundred films and so on. Yep, um, which is amazing. But uh, I wish you all the very very best of luck with Scardiff. Thank you very um, much. I'm looking forward to watching Curb Crawlers at some point as well. Yeah, and obviously you'll see me tweeting links and this that and the other. Um, 
but many thanks to Wayne. Yeah. For uh, thank you, man. Yeah. So it <laughs> sounds very, very good. But thank you for doing the other films that you've done as well, because it's it set me on a path. Let's say I'm now affiliated with Cops and Monsters purely because of a James Plum film. Hey. So. Well, no, thank you for picking them up. I mean, you know, again, it's 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 brilliant, and and obviously also you know taking the time to actually kind of talk about our stuff as well. I mean, you know. For me, the big thing is, you know, we're independent films and you guys are running independent blogs and stuff like that. And, and to me, it makes sense that, you know, we should be connecting up more often and kind of, you know, trying to cross promoting our, our stuff. It's it's a big thing when, you know, again, going back to the idea of communities and, you know, the, the, the on the independent side of things when you and, and Stuart you're a big you know kind of thing of this and a big supporter of British film I mean you know all the time you, you, I'm reading your, your, your kind of your blog and yeah, the stuff you paste on, post on Facebook and and through the the Twitter account recommending all of these independent British films and and it's great that you know we have these channels out there and that you know sites like yourself are, are, are doing that so no oh, thank you very much you know I mean, that came from, I've, I've been podcasting and writing for probably oh, obviously all my life with movies and mm. stuff, but I started the podcasting maybe four years ago. Mm. And then around two years ago, I realized, why am I not talking about British films more? Mm. I live in Britain. I have done all my <laughs> life. I was born here. I don't seem to do it. So I just started it up. And then since I started that, I've met so many amazing people. Mm. Mm. because It's a very, very small world. Yeah. This, this the British film community because you know I know Sarah Louise Madison you know so you you know so yeah, everybody yeah, seems yeah. to just cross over it's it's, it's very bizarre but yeah, very very wonderful and I just wish that I'd start doing this British stuff years before <laughs> uh, but I'm so glad that I just decided to to get it done because it's introduced me to people like yourself and yeah and it's, many it's, other filmmakers I think it's an exciting time and I don't know whether it's just you know so you know sites like that that you run that are making me more aware of it or whether there are just more, much more independent British films on the shelf. I mean, you know, I, I'm noticing, you know, much more. I think there was one week, there was like three films where, again, if you say it's a, it's a small kind of industry. I knew people who'd worked on each of those three independent British films that all released in Tesco's the same day. And that's, that's brilliant. I mean, that's, that's an exciting time for, you know, UK independent film to be in. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know whether it's just the the fact that you know you guys are kind of promoting this more and it's making me more aware, or whether there are there are there's just more kind of UK products getting onto the shelves. But either way, it's it's an exciting time. I think I'd love to take all the credit, but I think it's probably a bit of both. I think <laughs> <laughs> I think it is definitely there are a lot more people talking about films, and obviously social media makes it so much easier. I mean, back mm-hmm. in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, what did you have? Starburst magazine. That was pretty much in Fangoria. Well, it's yeah. funny you mentioned that. I'm actually reading like old uh, back issues of Starburst and Fangoria now. I've got Starburst 23, which is Empire Strikes Back, and that's just it's wow. it's brilliant. I mean, I, I I I wasn't reading it that early on, but uh, when I was reading, yeah, Starburst and Fangoria, that would be yeah just the information you'd get for that month. And it's brilliant reading like in Starburst they had the things to come, which was you know upcoming stuff. How much of that stuff never happened? Don't you like reading that? It's like there's going to be this film. You're like, I really wish they'd have made that one. I check, just, I check on IMDb oh, just in case they did make it. I hadn't heard of it. It's all the the John Carpenter films that never happened. Uh, Escape from Earth. Yeah. Oh, just no <laughs> stuff like The Ninja and stuff like that. You know, who's going to do like adaptations of like Eric Van Lustbader and stuff like that? Wow. wow. You know, there's there's an alternate dimension out there where that happened. So yeah. <laughs> so I want to watch them. Yeah. Maybe you could do a film where somebody travels to that dimension. It's just them watching. John Carpenter's The Ninja. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, you could do that as a kids movie at sports, couldn't you? Yeah, I, I don't know how many well if anything it would be educational wouldn't it because I think the kids need to learn about John Carpenter. They do. <laughs> they do. And not from his modern films but from things like The Fog and Yeah. Daily, yeah. Et and as soon as my wife lets me what uh, let my you know 4-year-old watch John Carpenter films then I'll be happy. Yeah, I'm trying Don't to think. start with memoirs of an invisible man. It is a PG, but it's not very good. Uh, yeah, it might, that might again have to be the gateway drug, though. You know. <laughs> yeah, because then it was. I like this one. Well, that's John Carpenter. So in a few years, you can watch. Uh, yeah, Halloween. Like Assault of Precinct Thirteen <laughs> yeah. and uh, Halloween One and Two and bits and pieces, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. But no, the very, very best of luck, James. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Thanks for taking the time out on a Saturday night as well. No, hey, that's, it was uh, hey. Any time I get to have a, a good chat about films is a good night anyway. So yeah, no, it was a good chat. Fantastic. I wish love to get you on some more episodes after the uh, after Scardiff and great. find out how it went and just keep us up to date with all the films yeah, and stuff that you want. Yeah, when, so. whenever you want, man, that'd be great. <laughs>